All right, I, I switched on the recording. So um, uh, uh, let's just first discuss the homework structure. So um, now we're basically preparing for the final report and then the last third of the semester will be doing the final, final project, I should say. And that project will have some software and, and the reports component and uh, we can negotiate the, the um, relative fraction of that. I'll put some options there um, for people who, want, who prefer to do software and people who prefer to write a report. Um, and the, the last, the uh, final, the homework I just said involves you preparing a presentation. I forget the exact date. The date is near the beginning of April when you'll give that presentation. Um, and <clears throat> next week I'll continue discussing applications. Probably finish the application lectures I have. Then on the uh, week of um, let me think, uh, the twenty fifth. Uh, Gregor, who is online as Gray, will um, give the class because I have to go to another meeting. I have a National Science Foundation compulsory uh, meeting uh, in that I'm the project, the principal investigator of a project they are reviewing. And um, he will go through the mechanics of, um, of, um, of the uh, GitHub and the report and things like that. That will be on the 25th. Then after that, you'll give your presentation on the short presentation, setting up your project. Yeah, I have one question, uh, Jeffrey. Yes. Do you also want them to do uh, a little tutorial so that we can put this on cyber training dash DSC on a topic? Well, why don't we structure the report so it has a uh, tutorial value? I think actually it will help the grading if it has a slide, if it's set up as a tutorial, we'll be able to run it and understand it. Because we will have to, we want to run these applications, run your software. Yeah, that would be fantastic. Okay. Yeah, I just want to, want to make sure that we uh, have that, that squared away. Oh, so is otherwise things, given that we're going to give you details on the 25th, is everything okay? Uh, yeah, from my side, yes. I can even do uh, earlier things. So if people are interested in learning about things earlier, I can potentially do this even earlier. I could do this probably on, oh no, Tuesday we have a different event. Yeah, so yeah, it should be Thursday, yeah. I will put up the material, however, earlier. Yeah, let's put up the material earlier. <clears throat> so, so just a question on the projects themselves. Do they have to be something original or can we try to- No, I don't think it's realistic to insist on originality. <laughs> I think they should uh, address an interesting area of AI first engineering with a uh, with a report that covers the application um, requirements and some software that demonstrates some aspect of it. I try to, to point out that the software doesn't have to, given you know the sort of reasonable the reasonable limits, the software doesn't have to be a state of the art research software or production software in the area, but it has to illustrate some type of um, type of uh, applicate type of algorithm that would be of interest. I gave the example of um, the stock market. Some one of the students did the stock market for one of their earlier responses. And so there you need to do a, um, a sub piece of software which uses recurrent neural nets because that's what the stock market predictions use which are not required to predict the stock market because it's not so obvious how, how, I'm sure anybody who can predict the software would not be in the, predict the stock market would not be in this class. Uh, they will be uh, put, um, moving ahead with their startup and uh, things like that and working with Robin Hood. So 
Um, and so it's just it's too hard to, to be state of the art in the, that type of area. Uh, there's one addition to, to this. Uh, this class typically values that you submit an individual project or if you are working in a group that you clearly have a larger portion um, uh, together. Yeah, but if people want to work in a group, they should contact me. I mean, we, it's, we usually actually have groups, but this class is so small. If we had a group or two, then there would only be a couple of projects. So that's sort of sad. But um, Yeah, I agree. So uh, I, I would I would think it would be better if each of you would be doing an individual project. Yeah, that's my, that I think is the default. If you can make a compelling case, you can just drop me in. That. Then the other thing is, is there should be none overlapping. So if we naturally, you can do an individual project, but each of you submits eight time, you know, all eight of you submit the same project. Well, that would not be good either, like, right? As you're competing, Gregor, there are only seven students in the class. Oh, seven, okay. Yes, yeah, so um, yeah, I, I, what well, Gregor said is correct. I mean, they say last semester when we had 50 students, then there were teams were set up. But those were, that was sort of a more low level class. This one is aiming quite, uh, quite ambitiously to do deep learning. All right, so um, any other questions? All right, let's uh, whip on with these um, uh, applications. All right, can you not see the um, shared screen? Yes. Yeah. All right, so uh, last time we uh, um, looked at uh, virtual pop, we looked at, uh, we ended with Fusion and the work done by uh, people at Princeton on using uh, deep net, actually with current learning networks to predict uh, fusion instabilities. Um, now we come up to a probably more mainstream application of AI. And it comes from a slightly surprising website I found. I forgot now how I found it. Um, it's some just relatively small German energy company. And they are building the software to support so-called virtual pop plants, which are um, if you remember, we pointed out at the beginning of the energy energy talk that in today's um, world of in, um, renewable energy and things like that, um, there's lots of power plants, and that is very different from the uh, traditional electrical grid, which has a few giant power plants, at least in in principle, uh, you're going to have, an, um, I don't know, millions of power plants on your grid because everybody can have their own solar panel or their own electrical vehicle. And all of these are linked together to manage the production of power, the storage of power, and the delivery of power. So this is this, uh, so this uh, energy company is in a pretty promising area, building software which will make that collection of um, of uh, distributed, somewhat erratic power, power resources, make it into a reliable giant system. And um, all right, so there's a link there, which you can look up uh, on the on the slides, which I gave you actually last year, last, last time, because that this, I started energy last time. Now I have to see how to, Go to the next slide. All right. So if you looked at, um, this is not the next slide. 
All right, South Africa, I didn't actually finish this slide. So there are four basic areas, um, just the basic uh, power grid. This is very traditional. I mean, I remember, I think I told you, I worked, for, I worked on projects for Niagara Mohawk, the uh, upstate New York power company back in the early 1990s, trying to manage their electrical power to predict so-called, uh, to predict instabilities. So, and, but now not only is the, um, the new power grid of all these uh, green renewable resources challenging, but even the old power grid has more and more items on it and each of those items has sensors. So the amount of data has dramatically increased. So we have the basic, and these are always being called smart grids. That's a very old term. Here we have the virtual PowerPoint, which is where this uh, company works. And then we have actually the, um, what happens on the home, well, the business which uses the power, everybody can have smart house uh, devices in their homes. You go to Amazon, it's full of devices to, um, to help you um, monitor and manage your energy use. Or actually that's even sold by the local power company. And there's a slightly, I think that's quite so important area, which is electrical trading. Um, in the uh, brokers and people bid for various forms of energy on an, an energy trading desk. All right, so here we have, uh, now we go through these various components. Let me just. Zoom is not very careful about where it puts all its sub windows so they can block the, the view for me. All right, so here we have the um, uh, classic power grid and um, there's lots of use of AI to basically monitor the different users, use that monitoring, which will be time series to predict what they're going to use and so that you have enough power available and you don't get these giant catastrophes like you saw in Texas recently. <clears throat> and it's also worth noting that um, when people lay power lines, they also lay data lines. So actually it's rather easy for the power companies to get lots of data because they've laid optical fiber and uh, with the power line so they can transmit data. Um, so that's, uh, that, that, that this is a, is a real big data problem. I should say it's not that well documented because I'm not aware of giant sources of open data in this area. I may be wrong, but I'm not aware of it. Um, I pointed out that your electrical car with this giant battery is pretty interesting. It used to be um, that people didn't have giant batteries in their home. Now, when they go home and tether their um, electrical car, which um, projections would say that electrical cars are gonna be actually the dominant form of automobiles in 20 to 30 years. Um, that not only actually interesting, interestingly um, puts a load on the power grid because you've got to charge them. Uh, they also have uh, those batteries there representing an amazingly um, large source of electrical storage, because one of the, as I mentioned, with these renewables, you need to store it. And again, there must be a lot of um, AI, which I'm not very familiar with, but it's clear that this is a giant low balancing problem. Gregor and I have worked on the equivalent distributed computing problem, where instead of having a, a collection of batteries and power sources, you have a collection of disks, which is where you store things, and computers, which produce things. That was actually called the grid as a, the, or the compute grid rather than the electrical grid. But it was called the compute grid by analogies with the electrical grid. And uh, we know that there is lots and lots of algorithms to optimize because once you have such a complex system, there's many ways of optimizing it. Um, and that's there, here is the, the Texas problem, which is also happened in New York, even a more few years ago, there was almost a total catastrophe when 
overloading in one area spilled over into another area and ground almost ground the the northeast to a halt. And um, the Frauen, this was a German paper, so they mentioned German uh, German uh, researchers here. And this is actually sort of what I worked on for Niagara Mohawk, detecting anomalies ahead of time. So we even saw that for the fusion case here. The, there the anomaly was in the, the transport of the uh, electrons on the, on, in, the, in the plasma. And um, the other thing can be, and of course, once you can have AI monitoring everything, you can find out the problems and then you can actually optimize the maintenance work so that they go and mend all the problems in a certain area. And if something only has soft errors, you might still replace it if you happen to have a technician in the area. So there's, there's lots of, so these are all resource management, load balancing problems, which is, that's, these are, they're pretty non-trivial because they're, then there are always MP complete those problems. They cannot be solved by, typically by um, simple uh, deterministic methods that execute quickly. You have to have heuristics and again, deep learning is very powerful in this area. Here we come to this so-called the virtual power park, which this um, company works on. And um, as well as core, you have to, you need to not only, um, you have to both manage these resources and you also of course have to make predictions. And those predictions can be based, those again, a, this is a typical action of a time series. When you use a recurrent network on a t t time series, it will typically, you can train that network to predict what will happen in the future. And I think I mentioned for earthquakes, well, I'm predicting four years into the future. For the COVID data that Gregor and I worked on, we, were, we predicted two weeks in the future. And typically we only actually looked a day or so into the future. And um, for the virtual power plant, power plant, then you're gonna to want to look many years in the future to plan investment in power, power sources. And then you want to look into the immediate future, whether it's milliseconds for a, a, a violent instability or days for, um, or actually hours probably for more local uh, issues, predicting using the measured data or comparing it with previous um, uh, values is very important. This sort of illustrates a key feature of deep learning. It learns patterns. So here we have a good example of what I call a complex system. This um, electrical grid is a complex system. So it's full of um, these uh, power producing resources, the power storing resources, and um, they are interacting by, by uh, in some fashion where we don't have a fundamental theory. However, we do have data because we've seen these things interact uh, act in the past, and so the, the like something like the uh, attention-based models in in um, time series in sequence to sequence mapping in time series, they are looking for patterns and matching and looking what happened when that pattern happened in the past, and so um, deep learning is a much more powerful approach, in my opinion, than previous ways of these problems were solved. And um, you have to fold in the weather, of course, which you can actually either again do by deep learning because deep learning uh, can learn from the actual time series of the weather and radar data, or you can actually run a simulation. Uh, I'm not quite certain. I haven't seen a paper which compares to clearly which weather, which is best, but I know the, I'm sure the National Weather Service does not use deep learning to give you weather forecasts. It actually runs the simulations. And um, so, okay, so uh, we've already pointed out the renewables make particular challenge because it increases the uh, number of variables and the, and, um, 
this is a much more complex problem with lots and lots of distributed small units. Um, okay. When it points, it claims here that uh, actually the use of AI has been made more, more precise, the prediction of power needs. And so you, you usually have a presumably a fudge factor, which they call the control reserve. You can reduce that control reserve if you have an accurate forecast. Um, so again, this is the, um, that, that was looking at the grid itself. The grid is connected to people. And those people um, have all these meters and things in their, in their homes. And um, those, we, we can expect those to, to get more widely used. Uh, and the smart home is um, a pretty old idea. I remember trying to invest in it and not, I mean, invest by putting it in my home 20 years ago. And that was a mistake because smart homes were not, did not catch on. And, um, but it seems almost certain that they will catch on. And um, so there's going to be a huge number of sensors in every home because sensors are essentially free. And you will put one in every light bulb and every dozens in every uh, significant device like a refrigerator. And those can be, um, mind to find all sorts of ways the uh, the particular consumer can save money and save energy. Um, and here they point out that uh, you can then link these home systems to the uh, to the grid and actually make them use energy when energy is actually easily available. Well, I'm, I when we I say stock market or uh, Electrical trading, I think, has similarity to the stock market and is full of, um, you just look at the uh, discussion of uh, Robin Hood, which we'll actually come to later on, probably next week, when we come to um, um, AI in the banking industry. We know that um, there's some quite surprising behavior of uh, produced by trading, because trading not only has facts, I mean, like you could imagine the electrical power grid. Well, it has people in it because people are consuming different amounts of energy. But the performance due to the renewable, to the actual energy sources is a little more deterministic. But uh, uh, when you look at the, the behavior of some, some stocks, they're pretty, uh, pretty surprising the, the way they behave. And um, when again, if you look at the stock market literature, it's full of algorithmic trading, which is a growing and growing uh, a component of the stock market. But uh, I'm certain people make enormous impact because they're the ones who decide which algorithms to run and when to make uh, stocks like GameStop go up or whether to whether to to send them down and things like that. That's, it's, it's a very interesting mix of people and deterministic devices. All right, here is a set of- May I just interrupt for a second because I have a here, useful idea for a project. Um, there is a, a, a site out there that you can explore called Duke Energy. And uh, the unfortunate part is where I'm living, for example, whenever we have a thunderstorm, coming up, we are having a very high likelihood that the entire power goes out in the region where I'm living. So one of the project ideas would be to explore, and I'm not sure if that's possible, if Duke Energy publishes the outage information, and if you can correlate this to the thunderstorms in, for example, the area with a neural net, that would be a fantastic project. I don't think that a lot of people have looked into this. Yeah, well, actually, I mean, Duke Energy emphasizes an issue I brought up in the past. There are companies which are really conservative. Uh, like General Motors is pretty conservative, but Duke Energy is super, super, super conservative. And so to persuade, I, once, I have spoken to them in the past, and to persuade them to do anything innovative is quite difficult. 
I meant this actually as a student project. No, I know you did. I'm just yeah. saying, yeah. I'm pretty, okay. I think you might find it not so easy because Duke Energy is probably not strongly committed to this. Yeah. And I haven't seen a discussion of that. And actually, but there were discussion of how AI gets infused into the utility industry is a pretty interesting one. In banking, it's quite clear what's happening. The banks are also, I don't think they're as conservative as Duke, Duke Energy, but they're pretty conservative. And they are not developing their AI in-house. They're just buying, they're funding companies and then they buy them. And I assume something similar happens in this area, that the companies like this little German company I took the data from uh, produce the innovative solutions and then eventually companies like Duke Energy um, adopt them. And of course, the fact there are so many renewables coming online, and at least uh, for the next four years, they will continue to come online. Uh, that should put some pressure on Duke Energy to understand these issues um, more deeply. I hope so. Because I think I say one of the whole interesting features of um, AI first engineering is that we're taking previous jobs and replacing by AI related jobs or digitization related jobs. And um, we need to understand how that expertise gets infused in, into that area. And I think some areas are, str are struggling simply because of that. But of course, Duke Energy in some sense has to survive because you have to have energy in in the in 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 Indiana and other places that Duke serves, and so you can't just replace them eat trivially by somebody else. Whereas um, in some other areas like pub publishing, journal publication, you can actually realistically set up a more innovative journal than the ones run by um, Springer, Elsevier, Wiley, and so on. So I, those areas are, I think. Uh, Journals are an, an area where there's some chance that actually the previous um, heavyweight companies in those areas will get replaced. Cars are an area where I, you would have think, thought that GM was, could not be um, replaced, but it probably is going to be replaced. It's probably going to lose out to Tesla and Neo and the other electrical car companies even though it has itself said it's going to pour enormous energy into electrical power. And uh, whether they can do that is not so obvious. In fact, I think I told you my little story of when I was in Syracuse with Gregor. We talked to Kodak. And at that time, Kodak was when this when we did this early 90s. Um, digital cameras, uh, well, they only just started to exist. And Kodak realized that they uh, had a problem and that their uh, classic film-based solution would be replaced by digital solutions. And they tried to invest in, in being a leader in digital solutions, but they failed. And so they're a company which is much smaller than they were in the past. They still exist because they're really a chemical company, but um, they did not manage to uh, catch the change that to digital cameras. So this thing, you know, it's sort of interesting to look at uh, the history of these various industries and how technology has changed them. There it was the miniaturization of sensors which allowed digital cameras to become initially competitive with film. And now of course, I think digital cameras are much higher, not much, but it's in higher resolution than film because film is actually very high resolution. Um, but that high resolution comes with the cost and the processing of lots of chemicals and things like that. Whereas that's not true for, um, uh, for the digital case. There are three questions in the chat. Did they say anything, Gregor? Anything I should answer now? No, that's for me. I just put some okay. comments in. Uh, Kodak went, by the way, through two more bankruptcies uh, uh, and they sold a lot of their chemical stuff. I mean, it was uh, actually, I mean, we, we, Gregor and I were in upstate New York and the, the Kodak, we were in Syracuse and Kodak's in Rochester. 
But Kodak was enormously important to upstate New York there. And um, the fact that Kodak was so badly adapted to change was an important reason why upstate New York did not thrive. And it probably is still not thriving. No, it's, uh, they, they, should, they, they really tore down their chemical plant. Yeah, I'm not surprised, it's, uh, they have to. And with the camera, they actually invented the, uh, the electronic camera. They, they actually had the first version of it. But because their chemistry plant was so important to them and to the regional uh, employment, they did not invest heavily. That's in why the, that's why these in the, uh, technology. I mean, there must be lots of the studies of this, but it's clear why these large companies cannot adapt. They have too many commitments to the past, which prevents them from embracing the, the, the future which is why the only way you can get to the future is to do the future on your own as a startup. And then the large company can buy the startup possibly and, and um, survive. I mean, a company that I met, actually, I remember about six years ago, I met a, a young, um, actually AI or cloud engineer who worked for a small startup that was purchased by Sears. Now, of course, he probably now regrets that because Sears is hardly a thriving company because it did not address to the economy. I mean, I obviously recognized that they had to do something and bought some companies in the area, but didn't transition uh, to the e-commerce area, even though it was actually the leading mail order um, commerce site for many years. I always used to buy things at Sears. I thought Sears was marvelous uh, 30 years ago. Anyway. This is all an interest. I think this aspect of the AI driven transition is pretty important because AI is probably more impactful than the previous transitions. I think AI is making bigger changes. Maybe digitization was a pretty big change, but AI is dramatically bigger than any other changes we've seen for the last, let's say 25 years. If you say digitization was 25 years ago, in a major fashion, AI is the next big change. All right, so here's our favorite uh, technologist, Bill, who is sort of interesting. Microsoft has a, used, to, used to have a bad reputation. Bill Gates is, uh, as far as I can see, a marvelous person <coughs> and has a really innovative, um, great view of the world, and uh, he has done a lot to help um, address various issues like he's put his foundations put huge amounts of money into to conquering disease and the, around the, around the world and he's also a huge and he is actually a really optimistic person I gather I have a good friend who knows him well and Bill is very very optimistic and he believe and for him everything is technology. And so, because he founded Microsoft on having better technology than IBM, which it did at the time, at least in some areas. And um, he believes technology can solve, solve disease and solve energy. And so here he has, uh, here was, I found uh, this discussion, which um, I gave some links for to, to various sites of various uh, companies that he is funding. And these are all small companies uh, which uh, may or may not succeed. So we have 26 of them. And they, they're not all using AI, they're all using new technologies and most of them are likely to have an AI component to them. And most of them are still pretty near the startup phase. And um, so this one is detecting methane emissions using sensors. And of course that will use a lot of AI in the processing of the, uh, the sensor signals to try to identify, convert that into, um, into, in, into um, information which can then track down the sources of methane. For each of these companies, I have a link to the company here, bluefield.co. And a link to this an amusing site called Pitchbook, which is full of profiles of startups telling you about their funding and their staffing level and things like that. 
and you could those links work though to get the most out of pitch book you probably have to subscribe and spend real money but i just clicked on the simplest links which give you some information these ones do not have pictures because they, when i browse the web looking at these i couldn't find any particularly interesting um, uh, pictures. The next one is uh, probably not AI at all. It's a nuclear reactor, which is designed to not have significant waste. And it's aiming at 2027. So that's a pretty long, that's 13 years after its founding. Um, here we have a geothermal startup. Uh, and uh, that's again alternative energy. Uh, Lilac is um, trying to fight, fight, extract lithium more efficiently, which is, of course, pretty important in today's batteries. Uh, Malta is, uh, I gather, a spin-off from Alphabet Google, which is basically Google. And it's looking at um, long-term energy storage. I pointed out that uh, a critical problem with renewables, renewable energy is where you store it. Because almost, if you look at wind power, or, 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 or solar power, both of those are cyclic. Where say a, a typical coal part, um, um, uh, um, power platform, it, it can run 24 hours a day at a uniform rate and it can also probably switch up its production when you want it. The sun, you're not allowed to change the sun uh, the, the power of the sun. And so whatever the sun gives you, you have to take when it gives it to you, store it, and then use it when you want it. So renewables give them a very big emphasis on storage. And I already mentioned that Tesla batteries are one way of doing that. And here we have a more classic, these are 2009 startup. Um, this is optimizing the use of the electrical grid. So this is almost certainly AI based and it's the classic problem. You have a collection of electrical devices wired together with, it, with energy coming in and energy going out. You need to find the best way to operate that and how to route the energy to the, from the producers to the consumers. This is a nice picture. And here we're trying to um, use uh, here solar power with, with these mirrors, which collecting data from the sun and to focus all that data on the same point. So you can get extremely high temperatures from a renewable energy source. And I gather that's useful for both. Well, I know it's certainly useful for steel, but I gather it's also useful for cement. And this is a type of application which you currently use fossil fuels because you just pour a lot of fossil fuel into your, into your heater and you'll get a high temperature. Well, here is a cheerful, uh, um, cheerful picture. And I, I apologize for our friend from Zimbabwe by calling him to be from Nigeria. But anyway, this is a set of Nigerians who, was, who sell a market and support distributed energy solutions but they do that in the emerging markets. All right, so here we, here's another company that works on concrete and it actually produces a better concrete, which um, is, um, makes the concrete stronger and uses less uh, energy and it, it pumps uh, carbon dioxide into the concrete. Notice these are quite old, some of these. This is 2007. Uh, possibly, they, you know, these are not software. Where software, you can have a revolution in, the, in a year. If you're building and if you're trying to make a, a concrete mixer run better, then it takes a little longer. Um, here is um, a company which is looking at uh, the things that make the grid, the smart meters. And um, it's again actually aiming at developed, developing countries because it um, wants to make these uh, meters very reliable and operate in remote locations. And it also 
links together to billing solutions. Uh, here is a um, here's a big lake, or actually I think it's a reservoir. It's an artificial lake, and it um, it uh, takes the energy from the underground um, hydro energy, and um, it then generates energy. So this is in the Czech Republic. I'm not a great expert on hydro energy. Um, this one is, I mean, uh, I pointed out the, the big area of which say GE, which is actually doing a little better these days. Um, it, GE has a, has a huge part of its future is um, instrumenting the devices that go into buildings and like the air conditioners and other devices that uh, and heaters which go into buildings and uh, I, I, I think I pointed out to them they have a, um, a, a very strong solution in the so-called inter industrial internet of things they have their own software for that area and um, 75f which I gather is must be a magic 75 Fahrenheit must be a good temperature. And um, we all know that energy is very inefficient because if we go to most buildings, including my home, some parts are freezing cold and other parts are far too hot. And the way people use the design home energy distribution system is hugely, in my opinion, hugely inefficient. And so I'm sure where factors of two improvement are possible by using simulations and, and optimizing, actually again, using AI to optimize the distribution of energy from the source to the uh, places where the energy is let, let out into the home. Here's one from MIT, which is again in the sort of hardcore engineering. This is, I don't think I use engineering to Papa will ever will study this for a while and um, it is meant to produce a cleaner process for turning, for melting, melting metals. So I, mean, Boston, I guess Boston Metals is from MIT. Here is um, Redwood Materials. They basically look at materials and um, they're trying to actually work on recycling to try to make certain that these expensive rare material, well, not uh, pretty rare materials, which are used in some of these, um, some, some of the key uh, components of uh, efficient systems, they are um, properly recycled. And I gather they're meant to be 11 million tons of lithium ion batteries. That's quite a lot of, quite a lot of battery. And they're meant to have to be recycled by 2030. And you need to re you need to extract the nickel, the lithium, and the cobalt, and uh, then use those to make yet better new battery cells. And here's a pretty picture I found of the chemicals that this company works on. I like the pictures here. They show what, um, especially the gold bars. They look nice, and then the gold grain. Um, <clears throat> But it's not neodymium, tantalum, cobalt, silver, copper, gold, tin, palladium, carbon, nickel, and lithium. But the, I, I think this page is quite a nice picture. All right. Um, this is a hydropower startup, which is meant to build turbines, which uh, uh, which can uh, gather energy from the from the water without uh, destroying the fish. Um, so. They're meant to be uh, smaller, and again, it's a more distributed solution. Um, here's another battery company. Um, if you look, we haven't done the automobile discussion yet, but the automobile is a mixture of AI and, and batteries, because batteries are essential for electrical cars. Um, uh, so F F Form Energy is a battery company, and Sierra Energy is a um, a company that uh, looks at waste disposal and how it can uh, turn waste into valuable products. It's a little like the uh, the Redwood Company, which was um, trying to recycle uh, rare elements. Uh, 
Um, well, here's yet another form of battery, uh, which um, is um, storing uh, storing the charge in, in uh, not in the, in the battery, but in the liquid electrolyte. And, and there's actually pretty simple chemicals, iron, salt, and water. And um, that's... All right, here we have another one of the um, um, industrial and, and, and the industrial equipment providers, which are for the HVAC, which of course runs in every building. And I pointed out there's obvious ways those can be um, efficient. Now this person is using indoor air. Well, we have to be a little careful about that with COVID these days, but this, uh, this uh, description was written before COVID happened. Here is another battery company um, from MIT again. Uh, this is a nice picture. It is got a, here's a, a device for capturing carbon from the atmosphere. And it removes carbon dioxide, which of course we'd like to get out of the atmosphere. Um, here we have a fusion company. I pointed out that uh, DOE has been working on fusion for whatever it is, 50 years or more, and has really not made huge progress. Well, it probably has, but uh, it still does not have a viable fusion solution. And, I, um, and that's what we actually ended up last time discussing. And um, this is another, uh, an alternative industry solution. So it, it's, it's really, I think it's quite, um, impressive how investors are willing to put their money into pretty deep issues because we know, I mean, if I was somebody came to me and said, invest in a fusion company, uh, you would have a hard time convincing me because I know how hard DOE, DOE has very talented people and they've not made so much progress. Um, what is this one? This is another energy um, a, a generator using magnet, magnets to uh, generate electricity. And uh, it's, this description here is so cryptic, I'm not certain you can find anything much about what it does. Well, Terra Power is yet another um, nuclear company. Notice it has quite a big building and um, it presumably is exploring again. I mean, obviously DOE has put a lot of energy into into nuclear power plants and researching the components because it always does nuclear bombs, but it's probably is, is more interested in the nuclear power plants. Here we have solar panels from molten, molten silicon. This is the last one. Um, so it is from a company called QuantumScape and at least still alive because I yeah, if you look at the last link that I put on in the last week or so. And um, it again is working on batteries and this time with Volkswagen. And they, I gather it, it obviously Volkswagen thinks they have an approach to batteries that will lead to competitive cars. And that is the end. All right, any questions on energy? So you looked at energy, it's, it's clear that um, although AI is important, uh, battery and other types of energy issues are equally important. Um, and in fact, if you look at most of these industries, there are multiple technologies. Um, the commerce industry is part of the, um, the software that makes Amazon and things run. But there's also the, the, uh, the trucks and everything which uh, have, have allowed this very cheap delivery. I'm staggered how, how Amazon can offer free delivery on such a lot of trivial small items. And presumably they still make a profit. Uh, and that's because they have such an efficient transportation system. Um, so, on the car, I pointed out uh, cars are um, 
uh, battery plus plus AI for the self-driving part of it, and also AI for the whole transportation system, which manages this whole complex system of connected or connected vehicles. Um, and we saw the energy, it's um, largely batteries and novel energy sources plus AI for some managing it all. And the, the, in the case we're moved to now, banks, it's a mix of AI and digitization. The fact that banks are moving from physical banks to digital banks is having huge impact on the banking industry, independent of AI. Um, um, so any questions or otherwise I'll move on to um, the last 20 minutes to banking. All right, I now let me find the banking case. All right, can you can you see the, the, the screen, folks? Yes. All right, so banking is interesting because I think it's the field which has the most money, mainly because banks have money. So, and also the part of banking we're interested in is not called banking, it's called FinTech for financial technology. And we have a few slides here. This is again selected from my recorded lectures. They're not all the slides. Um, and um, here, is a, here is a slide on um, the types of AI that you'll see in, um, in banking. It's a rather crude analysis, but it, it does identify certain areas like natural language processing um, is obviously important for because so much of banking's business is done by people talking. And also it's, it's captured by documents that have words on them. Um, image analysis is uh, going to be important, recognizing checks and interpreting um, documents which are, don't have a clear interpretation. Uh, we have robots like the, the later on, there's a trivial example of a robot that, a robot that counts coins. Um, well, we certainly have lots of AI involving prediction. Uh, you could say the stock market uh, example was uh, predictive analysis. Here it has this rather peculiar uh, topic called machine learning because image analysis, and, I mean, all these previous four all use machine learning. So maybe it just sums all those previous suns up, but it, it, so anyway. So it points out that um, the penetration of some form of AI is non-trivial. It's not universal though. And also if you, it looks here, it also points out that um, there are also, there's both consumer banks, this, uh, which don't seem to be here, investment banks, which uh, cope with the management of the wealth behind the system. And there are also insurance companies, which um, actually have a lot of money. Uh, and a lot of money is tied up in insurance. Um, and in fact, uh, we'll point out later on, the most amount of debt is actually a mortgage. So a, a very important part of the, this, uh, of this ecosystem of companies dealing with, with mortgages for homes and things like that. Well, here is just a little comment on the size of banks showing that uh, in the US, they expect the uh, this particular thing says a 15% decline from 2010 to 2020. I'm actually surprised that the decline is in more because I essentially never got, I only, I only go to a bank to get rid of my, my any, but somebody sends me a check, I have to go and cash it. So I do that at the machine outside the bank. But otherwise I see no, banks are not, 
terribly. Physical banks are not useful. The people in the banks often have skills which are useful. But uh, I think as the uh, digitized, digital capabilities of the customers in, gets more pervasive, we, I'm a little surprised that the, the reduction in physical branches isn't, doesn't make it much more than this 15%, but we'll see. Um, so here we see some of the, that's on the right. On the left, we have from one particular bank, Citibank, uh, some um, chart of, um, of how things are changing. We have e-statements are up to 52% in 2019. The agent contact rate, the people talking to the bank, banking people is down 6% in tw over two years. And we see an increase in digital customers and mobile customers. This is all very unsurprising in my opinion. Here is perhaps another, this is a, an interesting um, chart about jobs, which I already discussed. Namely, here we look at real banks, banks as you know them, which are the light blue, and the dark blue, blue, very dark blue is fintechs, which are the smaller startups. And you can see that um, AI, they expect to increase the employment of fintechs by 19% um, by 2030. This was from 2020. And uh, whereas the um, um, traditional banks will go down in employment by 9%. This particular side does not put in that the total number of jobs in fintechs is probably a factor of 10 less than the total jobs in the new banks. So this represents a net a significant reduction in the total number of jobs. You've lost hundreds of thousands of jobs and gained back maybe 40,000 or something like that. And uh, yeah, sorry, this number is here. I, I knew I had this number. So we have 336,000 lost in the traditional business and 37,000 um, gained in the um, gained in the, um, sorry, I'm not. Back. I'm sorry, I'm trying to get Zoom's technology to make a spotlight work. Doesn't seem to work. All right, so I, I will give up on that, doesn't work. It worked on the previous. Yeah. All right. So, um, so this this is again, and, and I pointed out these changing in jobs is um, a key feature of um, tr such transitions, and this happened many many times uh, over over the last maybe five hundred years since the industrial revolution. Um, and of course, it points out that um, incumbents find it very hard to actually hire the type of people they need to do innovative products. And they also find it probably, but more seriously, they probably can't manage them properly because their managers, their senior managers have no idea about AI, little idea about how to manage AI experts and things like that. Um, and so, the AI expertise in banking is going into fintech. Even I gather those fintech people have a trouble competing with Google and other types of uh, more attractive jobs. And of course, Google and Apple and others, are, and probably even Facebook, are moving into the financial area, PayPal and things like that. All right, so now we come to another section. And uh, there is a nice company called CB Insights. Um, 
uh, CB Insights makes its money selling to um, selling to big customers, lots of important reports. However, if you're interested, you can, I found you could log in with your, as long as you, you had to put a business address. It didn't like my Gmail address, but with my Indiana address, it allowed me to download the, the reports. And um, there's actually been, I haven't, there's a bigger discussion in the recorded lectures, but this does at least point out the richness of the application areas. And these are all covered in the CB Insights report. Uh, and uh, this particular picture were, came from 2019, which is when I did the original recordings. Well, I probably did them, yeah, I did them in 2020, but they were, the report was from 2019. And you can see where we have lending, blockchain and various security issue, uh, audit and risk and compliance. Uh, that's again a great idea place for um, AI because you want to look for anomalies. Um, we have all the tools to track customers and process billing. I pointed out on the previous slide that insurance was a big area. Uh, we have markets for capital to where you get the money, which you want to invest in something new. Uh, then we have um, people coping to coping with uh, oil rich shakes and things like that. Um, we need to transfer. There's a one company which I don't think I kept on, which makes its which, which focuses on software to, to efficiently, very quickly send electronic uh, financial records from place to place. And the one area which is giant is mortgage and real estate, giant area. Lots and lots of money is captured in buildings. So here we have. Um, let me try once more. All right, so here we have uh, the Q1 21, which was ends in February. So it's very recent. And I say what's staggering about this area is the huge amount of money involved. There is an investment in fintech of $13.4 billion within a single three month period. I consider that quite striking. I don't think of these other areas we discussed have that amount of money in them. The other thing is unfortunately for you lot, the, the number of new startups is quite small. What's, um, uh, most of this money is going into you know, later, so-called later round investments, uh, beefing up existing companies. If any of you follow Robin Hood, which is sort of the Robin Hood of, uh, of the millennium generation, which is um, pioneering investment for the uh, younger generation. They actually had to capture $3.4 billion as a special funding effort because they had a, a sort of a, an amusing battle between the uh, young generation and the old um, um, people who were shorting the market in GameStop and AMC and things. And uh, they that cost them three, they needed this liquidity of $3.4 billion. I don't think it cost them $3.4 billion. They just needed to have that money in hand to be able to cope with this huge amount of transactions. Anyway, and the biggest number in this whole field, if you look back, came from um, Q218 when the Ant Group, this is a giant Chinese group consisting of the people you will know, I think Alibaba is part of that, that is $14 billion. So these numbers are huge. And according to this summary, it's across the, every part of the country. And as I said, this is all mega rounds. Um, lots of money, a few large uh, injections of money. And there are some details here. And uh, this shows from Q218 to Q121. Q121 is just the, uh, um, it's only the one to date so far which is because um, the queue presumably ends at the end of March, the quarter. And it has, uh, as the curve is the number of deals, 
which is actually currently 361 through the end of February, projected to go to 542 by the end of March. <coughs> so that number of deals is actually pretty constant. And um, the funding amount is going up because they're going into, into uh, larger deals. But you can see this, uh, people have t pumped um, typically uh, at least $8 billion every quarter for the last few years. And uh, if you looked at the data of a longer period of time, which I think I have in the recorded lectures, you will see this all started around 10 years ago. There was almost nothing until then, then it just started taking off. And of course, a lot of today's successful companies were started at the beginning of that cycle. And uh, there is a 2020 report, which I didn't have time to go through in detail. And that 2020 report covers basically the same areas as the 2019 report, slightly differently divided. There's an area on uh, small and medium-sized businesses, SMB. Uh, otherwise, I think the topics are the same as before. And I just chose one for this client, for you, a couple actually, which might have some relevance to the up and coming generation. Here we have um, a growing in interest in social investment, where something is called ESG is important, environmental, social and government governance, which is evaluated for by investors who want to um, want to be socially conscious and so they invest in, or in, in companies that they perceive having a positive social impact. And you, we see of course that in every now and then you see an announcement that such and such a um, university investment has diversified away from carbon fuel, carbon producing industries and things like that. So this is obviously, a, in my opinion, a good trend and you can see here that this ESG concept is growing in, um, in, um, in media activity. This is from 2019, you probably can't see that. That's 2019 over here and 2020 here. And the last one in this set I just um, took, does it uh, gain? Uh, is something about uh, the future that here it claims that the number of credit cards. Unfortunately, this chart doesn't say the units. It says here we have a peak around 16,500, but there's certainly more. I mean, uh, I don't quite know how many credit cards there are, but there's certainly more than 16,500. So maybe that doesn't say what the units are. Anyway, the number of credit cards is actually interestingly declining. Whereas the number of the revenue from buy now, pay later, which there are some startups here, which are Catapult, Bright and Klarna, which basically work in that area, allowing you to defer payments, which of course credit cards allow you to defer it for, from well, always a month, but maybe more if you, uh, if you pay interest. Anyway, BMPL is a, a new fiscal, um, model which is growing in importance. So now let's uh, continue uh, on these topics. Here we have neo banks. And neo is just some, um, I forget which language it comes from. I should know as I studied Greek and Latin when I was uh, at school. Um, neo is, um, do you know, can you remember Gregor's G neo Greek or Latin? Anyway, it means new, whatever it is. And um, I, I thought it was Greek, but uh, well, it may be Greek. Yes, I also I, I have I have to look this up. So yeah, I don't know. Actually, when I said I studied, uh, I didn't actually study Greek. My parents refused to let me study Greek even many years ago because they said I should do mathematics, which is a very wise decision. When I went to school in those days, you had to learn Greek and Latin to train the mind, even though people argued it wasn't very useful, which is true as far as I know. I don't, but um, it does allow you to find stems efficiently if you know Greek and Latin. And I do know Latin quite well. I did lots and lots of Latin. 
Anyway, we have a, a whole, I pointed out that the way this world is happening is by, by setting up new entities. So we have a huge number of neo banks, which are banks done from scratch, and they're just banks. But they have modern technology, they're run by people who understand technology and manage technology well. And there are two types of neo banks. Uh, we have, we'll look at the banking as a service later on. So we have banking as a system, which goes from the consumer, uh, which is the front end to the, uh, or maybe it's even, you have other things besides uh, consumers, but you have other banks in the front end. But anyway, the front end uh, through the middle of processing, checking for, checking for fraud and things through the back end where all the money is and you extract it and transfer it and things. And so you have the full stack neobanks, which are like classic banks, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Citibank and you know, Chase Bank and so on. And then you have banks which carve out part of this segment. And so we actually have built, just as we were building distributed uh, power networks, we're building distributed banking networks where you can get a part of your banking from um, different parts of the, of the uh, commercial endeavor. Um, so you can see, of course, these cover a variety of different um, countries and we have WeBank must be Chinese and others are, others are Americans, there are many in South America. And these tend to be pretty regional because uh, they require some regional expertise to be able to make a good offering. And um, so you can see a clear increase from, um, in terms of value from 18.6 18, 18 in 2018 up to 63 estimated in 2024. And both uh, the number of accounts, accounts is going up. And um, that's uh, 187 million in, uh, in 2024. And here we have, I, I'll finish with this slide because I think it's pretty interesting. Um, so you can see the companies which, uh, the countries, sorry, where the neobanks are growing is the developing countries, China, 93% of the customers work with a neobank. India, 50, Brazil, 32. Here we have an Asian country, which is very conservative. Singapore, less than 1%. US, 2%. Germany is more, a little more innovative, Gregor, 4%. So neobanks certainly obviously need to be customized for the region because the opportunity is very different in each of these regions of course the us is a huge market and two percent of a two percent of infinity is still pretty big all right so remember next time we will finish this um finish uh, the, the, this these lectures and go on to the automobile industry or the mobility industry and uh, on the week after that gregor will go to the mechanics of the projects Okay, any questions? I will put up this recording, of course, and the slides and everything. There are now six chats. Did they say anything I need to worry about, Gregor? Oh, I just verified that uh, Neo is actually from Greek. So as far yeah. as I remember, yeah. Yeah, so it's interesting how these old languages live on in some ways. <laughs> um, but um, it's still, even in modern words, like a neo bank, you choose a word from ancient Greece. So that's sort of nice to see we're doing things like that. Okay, well, have a great, uh, have a great week, and I'll see you next Thursday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.